We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming today and happy Friday and last day of the IGF. Um, I, good to see some familiar faces here. And for folks I don't know, it's, it's lovely to, to meet you virtually. Um, my name is Ali Funk. <clears throat> I'm a senior research analyst for technology and democracy at Freedom House. Um, we are based uh, over in the US um, with offices of a few spots around the world. Um, I run our Freedom on the Net report, and I'm joined here today by two really incredible researchers who contribute to the project. Um, Gherkin Osteron is the author of our Turkey report. He recently joined the European Center for Press and Media Freedom as the Media Freedom Rapid Response Coordinator, and he's worked as a journalist and advocate in Turkey. And then Bruno, Bruna Santos is the author of our Freedom on the Net Brazil report, She's currently a visiting researcher at the Berlin Social Science Center and is an expert on platform regulation and intermediate liability, particularly in Brazil, but also around the world. So what we're gonna to do today, we only have 30 minutes. It's a short conversation. And I think the topic of the best and worst provisions of internet regulation could go on for a very long time. Um, so I'll start with a short conversation with our two panelists and then use our remaining time for any questions that you all might have um, or other issues you would like us to address. Um, as we talk, please feel free to use the chat function uh, in Zoom to pose any direct questions. You can do that uh, to the whole group or to me, I'll be monitoring that. Um, so before we start, I just wanna give a brief summary of Freedom House. We're an independent organization. We were founded in 1941 to defend and expand democracy around the world. Freedom on the Net, it's our annual country by country assessment of internet freedom. Um, we started in 2009. Um, we measure how easily individuals can access the internet, whether that internet censored and how fundamental rights like free expression and privacy are restricted or protected online. Um, we examined 70 countries, which is about 88% you know, or so of the world's internet population. So back in September, we released the 2021 edition, which found that internet freedom, I think unsurprisingly for, for folks in the room, uh, declined for the 11th year in a row. So the main sort of theme we were looking at this year is how a growing number of governments are asserting their authority over the private sector. So a laissez-faire approach to the tech industry has really created these opportunities for authoritarian manipulation of uh, different social media platforms data exploitation and widespread malfeasance. So in the absence of a shared global vision for a free and open internet, governments are instead adopting their own approaches to policing the digital sphere. Um, and while some moves reflect these you know, legitimate and welcomed attempts to mitigate online harms or rein in misuse of data or end manipulative market practices, many new laws simply impose excessively broad censorship and data collection requirements on the private sector. And Freedom House is concerned that governments are going to attempt to use the current drive for greater regulation for their own political purposes instead of curbing and decentralizing the power of tech companies. So to put it simply, we think that the high stakes battles between the state and the tech sector right now, human rights are becoming the main casualties. So our report argues that really now is the time for democratic policymakers to craft regulations that enable users to freely express themselves, share information across borders, and hold the powerful to account. Otherwise, these new technologies will reinforce digital repression around the globe. But exactly how to craft these regulations um, so they protect human rights and not undermine them, it's the million dollar question that we're gonna try to answer today. So I'm excited to have Bruna and Gherkin here. Um, who can draw on their deep knowledge in Brazil and Turkey. So let's dive right in. Um, Bruna, I wanna start with you. Uh, Brazil's Marco Civil is one of the world's most comprehensive laws protecting the rights of internet users. But in recent years, we've seen a wealth of new regulatory proposals in Brazil that would undermine these protections by increasing intermediary liability, 
censorship or different surveillance provisions. So can you talk us through what are some of the most worrisome pieces of regulation that you're following closely um, from the country? Thank you so much, Ali, and hi, everyone that's on the digital and, and also um, live room as well. It's nice to be here. Well, um, as you guys know, and, and as it's part of the, the Brazil report, um, we have been seeing in the past year or two years, I don't know, like a, a significant change on the approach to internet regulation in the country. Brazil um, became famous because of, as you were saying, like Marco Civil and the whole like multi-stakeholder approach that we used into the construction of the of a internet related bill that's mostly human rights centered and everything else. But um, in the past years, um, in, in, including in the Bolsonaro government, there has been some initiatives that were very concerning to us all. So to start mentioning them, like there was um, a few years ago also a presidential decree that created a centralized um, citizens database that was focused on data, like citizens data inter interoperability, but in the end of the day, the lack of safeguards and limits to the use of this data was something that um, civil society has been calling um, the Brazilian government on um, last in 2018, 2019, something like that. Other than that, um, it's pretty known to everyone as well, the process that we are still going on around the misinformation bill or the fake news bill, as we still call them in Brazil. Um, and this is a bill that had a lot of things about um, traceability, trying to put on some provisions around um, if a certain message got to a certain amount of people, um, every single person in the chain of the message should be identified or should at least like WhatsApp should at least have records on these people. And um, this is also a bill that was very strong on whether or not users should be identified online and like social, medias being, social media companies being required to ask way more personal data from users than, usual, than normal, just on, under the possibility that one day they might commit a crime and we need to identify them. So this whole change in how Brazil has been regulating or how Brazil has been attempting to regulate um, internet, but mostly focused on social media because it's a whole complete different part of the internet is something that's very concerning. And um, just to, to, to finalize this first answer, like um, two other initiatives have been um, very um, scandalous in the country in the past year as well. Like, so there is some tendency in um, regulating or allowing the use of surveillance technologies. Um, our police has been using a lot of um, intelligence related um, tools to monitor and to control some parts of activists, journalists, um, and also academia as well. So this has been something that's been going on. We are like rediscussing our um, anti-terrorism law. So that's also something that's pretty much on the table. And last but not least, um, last at the beginning of this year as well, Bolsonaro tried to introduce this provisional measure with must carry obligations to social media companies as well. Because I mean, we all know that um, he kind of works in things in, the, in very similar ways to what Trump used to do. And like to him, like whatever he wants to say is his freedom of expression. So he was, um, trying to push for the fact that content moderation in the country was a limitation to all of Brazilians' freedom of expression and trying to set this very strange comprehension of um, how social media works and everything else. So yeah, I would, I would stop there. Thanks so much, Bruna. I mean, I think two of the issues you brought up around sort of traceability, around encryption, um, and also these must carry provisions are two emerging themes in the conversation around regulation that I think over the past year and a half or so have um, really ballooned. And, you know, I'm thinking traceability in India's IT rules or some of these must carry laws, um, you know, in the US, for example, in Florida, um, I think are, are probably only we're going to see more pop up. Um, one more follow up question for you, and then I'll move on invite Gherkin into the conversation, but I wanted to take a moment because I know there's a upcoming election in Brazil this fall and we saw, you know, during the uh, Bolsonaro's first run, how you know political candidates really use social media platforms to push out electoral disinformation. So I'm wondering, you know, what do you expect to see in the lead up to that vote, and if there are particularly any of these sort of you know what I've called clashes between maybe Bolsonaro and or you know other political figures um, and some of the major social media companies, similar to what we've seen in like Turkey or India. 
Yes, thanks. Thanks, Ali. Well, I guess that um, what I've been just speaking about, like some of these um, regulatory initiatives, were kind of a sneak peek on, on how this discussion will go. Um, we know that um, the disinformation bill that we're discussing right now is a regulatory from like the parliamentary answer to um, how present was Bolsonaro on platforms such as WhatsApp. And um, we, we know that this was a political response, but we also know that the provisional measure I was just talking about is his Bolsonaro's own answer to, um, to content moderation measures that have been um, going on. And um, we just had, we're just also going through a huge process of reviewing our electoral code. And this might be um, like, this is not just the, the biggest review in the past years, but also might be promoting the, the greatest alignment in between our electoral regulation and the digital space. Um, this discussion is also yet to be finalized, but um, there are some provisions about um, how our data protection um, authorities should be much better aligned with um, the electoral justice, just so we could address and redress some of the data, data um, personal data misuse. Also, there, is, there are some provisions that aimed to prohibit social media from moderating content that was related to the candidate. So I think this is gonna be one of the main um, battlefields for the next year. Like, there is going to be a huge fight in between, not just Bolsonaro, but like mostly um, all of the Brazilian polit politicians around social media not being able to remove their content because they want to continue being able to, I mean, express and, and share whatever disinformation or false um, allegations they have been doing in the past. Um, and last but not least, um, Telegram is gonna be the next um, battlefield as well. Like. Um, in the previous election, it was WhatsApp. It was WhatsApp because of the encryption and like the misunderstandings around how relevant encryption is for everyone. But now that we are seeing a lot of Bolsonaro supporters and himself moving um, to what to Telegram, and also the lack of response to the plat from the platform to law enforcement agencies, um, politicians and not just politicians, but the the process that is the misinformation bill is trying to introduce the possibility of um, blocking the blockage of the platform if they fail to comply with, I don't know, uh, many orders from law enforcement or president justice. So Telegram is gonna be the next battle and um, other than what I mentioned before, like Bolsonaro trying to avoid um, falling under any content moderation possible. So interesting, the um, discussion of WhatsApp moving in, into Telegram, um, I didn't expect that. Uh, Gherkin, let's pull you in here. Um, I'm interested more in the Turkish regulatory environment. So, you know, internet freedom, as you've been tracking um, in your close work with Freedom on the Net, it's dramatically deteriorated in recent years. So what's the government's approach to regulation in the country and how has this impacted uh, human rights? Thank you, Ali. Uh, in the last 14 years, Turkey has uh, dealt with some form of regulation that is uh, regulating the publications that are made online. And uh, since it uh, emerged back in 2007, it always had uh, the idea of protecting the citizens against uh, some form of uh, criminal activities on the internet. Uh, originally, this idea uh, emerged out of protecting the children and gradually it, uh, its scope kept expanding and expanding. And as it is uh, standing today, it has uh, gone through multiple amendments and revisions. And uh, so far, it only seems to be serving for the protection of the governing alliance. Uh, over the years, uh, the expanding scope of censorship and access blocking orders uh, was kept, uh, kept multiplying. It was uh, originally a handful of organizations that were, uh, that were authorized to block access to uh, certain content online only after a court order. Then this court order requirement was taken down and then the number of uh, authorities, the number of institutions that could block access immediately were multiplied. And uh, currently as it stands, it is uh, dozens of different uh, groups. And uh, there has been a significant update in 2020 uh, but uh, this has taken place in absolute lack of multi-stakeholder principle. 
Uh, originally, the Turkish government claimed that uh, they would be consulting the opposition parties, they would be consulting to the civil society, experts, researchers, uh, basically people who are, uh, who are capable of uh, saying a few words in this matter. However, we were uh, awakened one day with a draft proposal that was sent to uh, the relevant commission on the, uh, in the parliament. And suddenly uh, it passed through the parliamentary stages and became a law. It was so sudden that it was actually uh, passed in the parliament at 3.30 a.m. And very quickly it was approved by the president and became a law, came into force. And before anyone could understand what it actually meant, before we could uh, quickly read through the in between the lines of the draft bill, it was already signed and approved. So uh, the most recent uh, amendment to the Internet Regulations Bill in Turkey initiates uh, supposedly protection of pers personal data by offering uh, a compulsory uh, data localization uh, procedure for companies operating in Turkey. And uh, along with it, there is also introduced a new measure to, uh, to monitor and uh, regulate data uh, in Turkey, that is the content removal orders. Uh, basically, since the law has, been, uh, law has been passed in the parliament, immediately afterwards, newsrooms in Turkey started receiving content removal orders from the government authorities. This uh, was a bit too uh, quick, I guess, but uh, it also showed uh, what it would be used for. Immediately the day after we had back then started receiving content removal orders regarding articles that were published as far back as five years ago. But this uh, content removal uh, process is equivalent uh, to burning down of the libraries in the medieval times. It is erasure of digital memory and it definitely impacts people's uh, free expression right or uh, media freedom even to a great extent, as well as access to uh, accurate, reliable information in a timely manner. Because up until recently, up until the time when content removal orders were initiated, you could still see quite many people in Turkey who were suggesting that they would be using VPN services, they would be using this or that service to access the content that is banned in Turkey. However, with the content removal order, the very content that they will want to uh, access to are now being taken down. And uh, in the meantime, in these days, the government is again propagating for a new social media law. Uh, apparently the one that was passed last year uh, is not enough. This year they're claiming that they are going to protect the women online. However, this is the same government only months ago, uh, having withdrawn a signature from the Istanbul Convention that was uh, the guarantee for protection of women and girls on, uh, in social life as well as online. However, uh, the new social media law uh, demands of the government is not uh, alone. It also goes hand in hand with the fake news law and also foreign funding law, which is uh, aimed at targeting free media in the country. And all of these are uh, rumored to be in connection with a, a potentially upcoming uh, early election in the country. And uh, we are watching uh, also from the Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, what we have seen in Uganda and Belarus, we are watching these examples uh, in, uh, with concern, basically. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I think you touched on a few key points. Um, one is how sort of really genuine online harms, like, you know, child sexual abuse imagery or ch child exploitation or her gender-based harassment um, can be used uh, around rhetoric to go after sort of political speech. And, and, um, and then I know you also touched on, you know, data localization, which is something that we at Freedom House has been thinking and um, talking about for, for some time. And, and Bruno, you know, we touched on again, the traceability and must carry laws. So we have about 10 minutes left and I wanna leave, you know, a couple minutes for, for audience questions. But before we do that, Gurkin, I'm wondering if we can just zoom in then on the title of this uh, panel, the, the worst practices of internet regulation. If you had to pick two or three, what are sort of the worst provisions that you're seeing either in Turkey or around the world that you're most concerned about? Nowadays, actually, this uh, personal rights, privacy uh, affairs, use of personal names being used for censorship uh, actually is concerning me because uh, this seems to be 
uh, frequently used lately by uh, people of, uh, who belong to radical groups who are polarizing the society. But when, once they do something harmful for the society and when they are being revealed for their actions, they are pulling the card that uh, their personal rights have been violated, that they cannot be referred to even in the news uh, for the things they have done and for the wrongs they have done. And uh, this, I think, is setting a very dangerous precedent. For example, also in Malta, recently the government has initiated plans to anonymize court, uh, court verdicts, that uh, the court judgments will not be publicized with the names of the criminals. And this, I think, is going to uh, have a really bad impact on media freedom, but also society's right, right to access information. I was not aware of that um, development in Malta, so thank you for sharing. Um, Bruna, let's give you the exact opposite. What do you think some of the best provisions are? What What are the sort of um, components that we as sort of civil society group, you know, between us three and also can work with the, the private sector and governments to make sure um, that we want in some of these pieces of regulation? Yes, um, I'm not the one to praise um, regulations that are just like fly away from countries, but um, and in Brazil in the past years, um, there, there has been a lot of like um, academia, academics and, and civil society activists as well that were praising a lot um, of the provisions of NetDG. But if, if, if I could just pick one that's kind of present there um, on the, the misinformation draft bill as well is the, the transparency reports part, um, which, which has been like one of the key points that um, Coalizão Direitos na Rede has been advocating for in the past years, because we do need to have more access to, to what these platforms have been doing. And this is key to um, trying to address um, misinformation at some level. And so that will be one of the things for me. And um, and I would, I would just also like to say that it's interesting to watch this change in the, the ethos that marked um, internet regulation in these past years. A few years ago, it would be um, almost, um, it was it was almost imperative to avoid regulation or like harming the internet over like just making more rules. But now, now first of all, regulation is no longer a taboo, but also we want those kind of, kinds of discussions of principle-based and aimed at the correct target. And the correct target should be like more um, content than um, users' um, behaviors sometimes, which like whatever is the point that it's not gonna harm our rights or anything like that. And um, last but not least, I, I do like and enjoy all of the asymmetric kind of take that both the DSA here in the EU and also the, the, the misinformation draft bill is also taking on in Brazil. Like we do need to understand the differences and intricacies between the different um, platforms, services, and, and also companies online. And um, also the take against online advertising, political or not, like this is huge. And I do think this is gonna be um, our next um, top challenge for the upcoming year. So these are the things that are making me happy. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head when you think about sort of the shift in our thinking um, of moving away from, oh, regulation is something bad and it can um, you know, just empower the state to thinking about, oh, if we do regulation right, it can actually be better for our rights and thinking through things like transparency requirements, making sure these sort of laws acknowledge that not every company is the same and regulating them as such um, can have some really big harms and even, you know, submit the big players in the market. Um, you raised some really great points. So we have some questions in the chat. Um, yeah, Gherkin, thank you so much for sharing the link. That's really helpful. Um, I also shared the Freedom on the Net link. Um, Kian asked the question, so how can the private sector push back against content removal orders and demands for data in contexts like these, um, which is really great because I think we're going to, you know, an increasing number of sort of government demands for personal data or to remove um, certain types of speech. So Gherkin, I'll go to you first, I think, because this is a big issue in Turkey. And then Bruno, if there's anything you wanted to, to add on Gherkin's answer. Sadly, I also is... have a comment in the room, if you don't mind. Yeah, how about um, let's go to Gherkin first and then um, we'll go over to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Thanks. Sadly, it is one of the major issues in Turkey also, even though uh, it is not publicly announced. Uh, 
unofficially, uh, the Turkish government has been requesting uh, personal data of hundreds of, of thousands of users from uh, various platforms operating in the country, claiming that they are linked to terrorism activities in the, uh, in the country. However, uh, private companies also should uh, acknowledge that it is the users that make up most of their content despite the centralist design of their structure. And if companies sell out the users, if they comply with the requirements of uh, such coercive laws uh, and provide the personal data of their users, they will risk losing their popularity among the users that actually rely on these platforms to access information, to express themselves for various purposes. However, uh, it should be the uh, it should be the pr uh, private companies also uh, responsibility to think about the future of their companies and not uh, sell their uh, their users out. On the other hand, uh, given that these are private companies and they do not necessarily have to guard the rights of the citizens, it is again falling upon the citizens' responsibility to uh, either share or not their uh, personal data with the companies or uh, with the regulators or the government. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I think you raised some really important points there. Um, Bruna, if you don't have anything else to add, I'll, I'll leave space for you. Otherwise, um, let's move to the, the question in the room as well. Uh, uh, my name is Naza Nicholas from Tanzania, and uh, I work with uh, Internet Society. And I, I was having a, a comment rather than a question. And uh, the, the good news is that uh, the freedom on the net is the human right, and uh, the worst, uh, uh, the bad or the worst is, is that uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, governments in, uh, that are putting uh, stringent regulations on, on the freedom on the net. But I think the balancing act will be to be able to, um, to promote both uh, freedom uh, online as well as uh, responsibility, because uh, if uh, you were to imagine uh, uh, you cross the road and you run the red light, I think you, have, you will have uh, uh, actually uh, broken the regulation. So I think uh, we tend to think that uh, on the internet is different from the normal life that we live, but uh, actually we have to live with uh, the, the freedom of expression as well as, uh, as the uh, uh, responsibility online. That, uh, that will be key uh, going forward. Thank you. I think that's a great point of, of how can we think about, um, you know, make, creating certain forms of regulation. So not only we're empowering for expression, but um, ways that we can hold, you know, individuals or companies accountable, um, but doing so in a way that still is rights respecting um, is a really great point. Um, I see we have another question in the room, so I'll pass yes. it off. Just uh, be mindful, we have two more minutes, but I think that's enough to take one. Yeah, I'll question. try to be fast. Uh, my name is Alexander Isavnin, I'm from Moscow University, and for the record, for the purposes of Russian law enforcement, I don't know who organized this session. Uh, I would like to tell that Russia has the most advanced uh, internet regulations. Since 2011, Russia has started protecting children. Uh, protecting children from suicides, for drugs, from LGBT propaganda, but we definitely don't know how effective this is. Uh, so uh, answering the earlier questions, uh, that what should we do? We should measure possible impact uh, in the countries where such regulation exists and spread the word. Uh, because such protections are ineffective, uh, Russian regulations have a lot of waves uh, by spiral extending uh, amount of co content to be blocked, amount of information to be surveilled uh, from the citizens. Um, uh, and actually, uh, at the last year, we have sovereign internet regulation uh, and addition uh, bulk very tapping uh, and uh, snooping on citizens. Uh, but as I checked, uh, Freedom on the net pages. I see that there is no changes uh, in a rank uh, in an index of Russian federations from 2012-2021. That's a zero change. While we have regulations related to fake news, related to COVID protection, uh, and uh, regulation uh, related to sovereign internet. Uh, the same is only one point uh, change in ranking 2019-2012. Uh, 
So I, saw, I, I think that the organization, I don't know the name uh, of this organization, is who are they, uh, who works on freedom on, on the net, should be more careful in creating its own index. Thank you very much. Thanks so much um, for your comment. We, uh, you know, our, we take our research very seriously and uh, making sure that we're properly vetting all the information. Um, and I think, you know, as you, it's a great sort of report online there that you can read. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and we can carry the conversation um, more forward. Happy to chat further on that. Um, we are now out of time. I just wanna thank Gherkin and Bruna again for joining me today in the conversation and everyone for um, listening in. This has been great. And I, I hope everyone has a lovely end of the IGF season um, and a great weekend. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Ali.